Uh, I want to start off th- today in just talking about major beliefs about God, uh, because there are a host of beliefs about gods and gods in our world. And so I want to just quickly survey those belief systems to help us understand better the biblical, um, you know, I'll say belief system, what the Bible teaches about God. The first one, and this is probably the largest uh, gr- group, is called monotheism. One God and only one God exists. And, and so that the, the major monotheistic religions are Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Between Christianity and Islam, you have two to three billion people, last number that I saw, that affirm um, monotheism. Now, monotheism, just in general, says, doesn't say anything about the God. It just says there is a God and there's only one God. And so um, we're not, these systems are not, generally speaking, saying much specifically so that we would recognize that Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, all three of them are going to have different beliefs about the one God. And so, uh, but that's the, probably the most significant. A subset of monotheism, or sorry, the monotheist would say there is one God. That, that would be basically his assertion about God at his foundation. Uh, a subset of monotheism, it's related, uh, but it's, it's still present, but not as popular. I mention it, though, because we see it particularly in American history is deism. That there is one God who exists, but he is relatively uninvolved in the universe. Um, that there is a, a God out there that's just watching us from a distance somewhere, and that's it. And we don't know him, can't know him, maybe we know him, but he's not active in, in the world. And so it, the idea is that the, the deist would say, yeah, God exists, but God is not here. Um, another belief system about God is agnosticism. Uh, the, the agnostic says and believes that God may exist, but none can know for certain. And you're going to have two different agnost- kinds of agnostics. There are going to be those who are, are, are kind of universal agnostics that nobody can know for certain about God uh, or if God exists. And then you have the personal agnostic. I don't know if God exists. And, and, but either way, they're going to say, I don't know if there is a God. And so that's real simple. Even simpler, I think, is atheism. There is no God. And and I just still think it is intriguing that atheism is generally a response to a particular God. You you know, it's not just somebody looked around and said, nope, there's no God. It's that there was a belief in God of some sort that was ultimately rejected. And, um, And the atheist just simply says, there is no God. Then you have polytheism. Um, This is that the universe is filled with many gods. This is not the same, as we're going to come to here in a couple minutes, as pantheism. The the polytheistic idea um, is that just just that there are gods everywhere. We see it in the Bible. We talk about the gods of the Canaanites, the gods of the other peoples. They were polytheistic. If you've read anything of Greek mythology... Uh, Norse mythology, Roman mythology, uh, you're dealing with uh, polytheism. Uh, even uh, Native American religions are generally polytheistic with what's called animism uh, thrown into that. And I'm not going to get into animism today, but there's the, so the, but some of the, many of the tribal religions believe there are gods, but also that there are a lot of other spirits uh, as well. Major, belief, major systems of, that, that teach this would be Taoism and Shintoism. They're both uh, Eastern religions, Asian religions. And then very present in America is Wicca. And it depends on which kind. There's, there's a lot of variations within that. Uh, but Wicca is, is where you're going to see polytheism theism in America primarily. 
um, in which basically they're, they're various deities, much as you see in, in ancient paganism, they're going to be saying there are gods of the trees and the rivers and the mountains and the valleys and the streams and all of that. Um, and so the polytheist says there are many gods. Uh, an interesting variant of that is henotheism. Only one god is worshipped, but other gods are believed to exist. So henotheism is polytheism. It's a subset of that. Um, but they only worship one god. And I mention this one because there, sometimes people read the Bible as if it is henotheistic. Theistic. Um, as if it affirms the reality of all of these other gods, but then says, but we only worship one God. And, and the Bible is, does not say that. And, and we're going to talk, that's what really what we're going to be talking about today, is what the Bible does say about God. But it, it does not say there's one chief God and a lot of other gods. Uh, the Henotheist says, we worship this God. He is our God. And that other people have other gods. It's kind of a pluralism when it comes to worshiping gods. And the Henotheist says, I serve one God. And you have pantheism. So that God is a universal force. There's a typo there. But God is a universal force that fills all creation. So that creation and God are one. And this is probably familiar to us from Buddhism and Hinduism. If you know anything at all about their teachings, you've bumped into this. And, and Hinduism, it, it also is polytheistic, but uh, I'm put it here because it, there's this emphasis on the pantheism. Um, and so that when you, you look around, everything is a part of God. God is in everything because creation and God are, are ultimately indistinguishable. Um, you actually see pantheism of a sort in Star Wars. Anybody know what the force is? This universal, all-pervading force that affects every living creature. And until they added in the midichlorians thing, you know, it was pretty much straight pantheism. And it, if you don't know Star Wars, it doesn't matter. Midichlorians, yeah, it, don't worry about it. So, you know, it, it's absolutely not relevant to the conversation. So. <laughs> um, that, that's the idea, actually, that there is just this, this impersonal divine force that fills everything. And so that uh, the, ultimately there is no distinguishing between, between the creation and the divine. And so that, you know, in uh, Buddhism, the ultimate aim is nirvana. Nirvana is not heaven. It is an, an escape into nothingness. It essentially is to lose your essence in the nothingness of the universal force. So that one pantheist described it as, uh, as, as your drop of water that is returning to the ocean. There's no longer any consciousness. and you, know, you, you don't exist. You're just uh, uh, absorbed back into the everything. And so the pantheist says, God is everything. So what does the Bible teach? That's what we ultimately we want to answer. What does the Bible teach? The Bible is very clear. God is one. And, and so we're teaching and, and, and affirming a uniqueness of God and a singleness of God. Now, some of you already think, wait a second, I know that there's not a strict singleness because I know what the Trinity is. We're going to come to that. Um, but we, we have to start, and we really, I think as we try to we understand God and we work through some of the complexities, we start with the biblical statements that God is one. So that in the Old Testament, we have several declarations you know, that are just very, very plain to this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this is more than a statement that God is a God. It's, it's not just saying that God exists. 
It is saying that the, this God is truly one God to the exclusion of many gods and, and to the exclusion even of a multi-parted God. But rather that there is a, a single God. Uh, and in fact, if you have your Bibles, go to Isaiah 44. I want you to see this, this passage. And, and I would encourage you, if you want a relatively um, shorter passage of Scripture to, that really lays out some significant practical theology about God, go to Isaiah 40. Start reading Isaiah 40 and go to the end of chapter 45. Um, it's a really good place to start. Um, but Isaiah 44, verses 5 and 6, um, it says, One will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. So he's talking about the, those days that are coming when, when Israel will name itself, will be, be the Lord's. Verse 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Beside me, there is no God. We have that very clear statement. God alone is the only God. There is no other God but Him. That, that's part of what, that's the biblical statement. God is one. And you have other references there on your sheets that you can look up. Um, the New Testament says exactly the same thing. At Mark chapter 12, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. When he's a asked the, what is the greatest command, yeah, we summarize it in saying, love the Lord God, your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, or you know, I would, I would summarize it even more and say love God supremely. But in, in the quick summary, we miss an important point. Because when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? He starts with the, the Deuteronomy declaration that God is one. He starts by saying, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the Lord it's our hero Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. So if we're going to understand the great commandment, we have to start with this oneness of God. First Timothy quotes it very clearly, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So, how many gods does the Apostle Paul declare there is? One. That's it. And, and now you're thinking, well, wait a second, Jesus is God. Now he says, man, <laughs> now we just open some other cans of worms. I understand that. We're going to, in weeks ahead, work through how all this is interwoven together um, so that we, this is not a Pauline denial of the deity of Jesus. But this is absolutely an, an, an affirmation of the singleness of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. I don't remember if I put it on there or not. Ephesians chapter 6 says there's one God. It's just that simple. There's one God. So the Bible emphatically declares the singleness of God's nature. That he is one God, not many. The Bible is also emphatic about God's relationship to other gods. A well, simple biblical statement, I made this last week, is God alone is God. That, that's really it. That summarizes everything the Bible says about all the other gods. God alone is God, so that no other God exists but God. Jehovah. And, and so we have now these, these statements regarding the deities of the, of, of the various other nations. And the first thing the Bible says, or one of the first things the Bible says about them is God alone exists. God, those, they don't exist. God exists. 
And God alone exists. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35, it says, To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. If you happen to still be in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 43, verse 10, it says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. And at the end of Isaiah 43, 10, Before me there was no God, nor shall there be after me. Uh, it's just that simple. There was no God before God. There's no gods after him. There are no other gods but God. Which may, may raise the question, well, wait a second, the Bible does seem to affirm the existence of Baal and Moloch and all these other things. I mean, we, we have like the contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. You have these various discussions about these other gods. So how, I mean, if the Bible says they, are, they don't exist, why does it sometimes treat them like they do? James 2, you know, we see it not just from the Old Testament, but the New Testament. You believe that there is one God. You do well. I mean, that's a pretty good summary. James is saying, you believe there's one God. That's a good thing. There's only one God. Even the demons know that. Um, and he goes beyond that. I understand the context of James. He's moving beyond that simple statement of, of, of truth. But he's making a simple statement of truth. There is one God. We see that the um, idols are not real gods. But they are lies. That's, that's where we see scriptures dealing with them. How it responds to them. So Jeremiah chapter 10. I think it's on the screen, but I want to show it to you in the, in, in the passage here. Because it says, verse 11, Jeremiah 10, Thus shall you say to them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. I mean, well, he just acknowledged these gods are real. I mean, he kind of talks about them as if they exist. But now it goes on and it says, speaking of the true God, He has made the earth by His power, he has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings out the wind of his, from his treasury. So you have there the, the creative power of God, not only making the earth, but also continuing to control, direct the earth. So that, verse 14, everyone is dull-hearted, Without knowledge, every metalsmith is put to shame by an image. He's talking about idols. For his molded image is falsehood. There is no breath in them. They are futile, a work of errors. In the time of their punishment, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob, the God of Israel, is not like them. For he is the maker of all things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. So what, what God says, what Scripture says about the gods is that they are, they are dead. They are empty. They are lifeless. There's nothing in them. And when God comes to bring the world to judgment, these images and falsehoods will cease. They will be destroyed. Not because Baal is actually a god, or Molech, or Quetzalcoatl, or any of the other gods. And God is going to end those lies. They will no longer exist. Now, I think I've alluded to this here recently, but we do recognize there's demonic forces at play in idolatry. And so when we say that there are no gods but God and the idols are our lies, we do not mean that there's not any kind of spiritual realities behind them. Rather, the realities that may be behind the idol are fallen angels. They are creatures that, that have no power over God and have no legitimate claim to the title God. 
That's part of the reason they're lies. They're, they're, they're these, at best, these inflated egos of, of demons. And, and so they will, you know, all of these lies will perish. So the Bible, um, it says in John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God. Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So we have Jesus himself making the statement that the God is the only true God. And the implication is there are other false gods. We know from history, from scriptures, there are a lot of false gods. But there's one true God. And so the Bible emphatically denies the actual existence of other gods. Not, it does not deny that other people worship other gods. By any means. It does not deny the existence of idols. It does not deny the existence of a spiritual force working behind the idols. But it denies that there is any claim to deity in any of the idols. That they are, they are nothing at, at all. They, they are nothing when, it's come before, when it comes to God. And so what we would say is the Bible is monotheistic. The belief system of the Bible, the belief system of Christians, is monotheism. So, how do we respond to this? I don't think, even though I've kind of belabored them, I don't think they're necessarily difficult concepts. And, And I'm trusting that we already believe all of this. But how do we respond? What do we do with the fact that there's only one God? Or is it just a nice tidbit of information that we keep in the back of our minds? And Okay, I know something else. And obviously our goal with this study is to do something more than put knowledge in our head, but to respond. And, and we see several responses in Scripture to the, this uniqueness of God, that He alone is God, and that into the singleness of God, that He is one. God alone is a God able to see and hear. Because all the other gods are not real. I mean, we, we know that. They can't see and hear. And, and to bring it into modern context, the gods of this age cannot see and hear. So that those who, who truly worship material goods are worshiping something which cannot hear them, cannot see them. But God alone, because He is the true God, He does see and hear And very personally, he sees and hears us. So not only does he, can he, he does. And and he hears our prayers. He who planted the air, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? And it's a rhetorical question. And the the answer in the the Psalms, of course he does. I mean, if the the one who, who created the ear, and all of its marvel, I mean, it's incredibly complex, he who devised and designed this ear, can't, wouldn't, wouldn't be, he be able to hear? He who formed the eye, even more marvelous than the ear, don't you think he can see? Of course he can. And the psalm takes us from there and, and it reminds us that he sees us. And not just generic, yep, I can see. I can see things. There's a lot of things I can't see. I can't see what Mary's doing in China right now. I'm assuming she's sleeping, but I have no idea what what, what she's actually doing. But God, because he is the only God, because he is the true God, he sees and hears us. And our response is that response of, of trust and praise that he is able and that he is is involved. In our life. And we can take this verse and we can go to the commands of Jesus to pray and the exhortations in the New Testament to pray. And the fact that God alone is God and He is truly God drive, should drive us to bow before Him because He's promised He will hear us when we pray. It also teaches us that God alone deserves the worship of men. And Jesus answered Satan in His temptations. It's the only worship and serve God. That's it. God alone should you serve. It teaches us that 
we cannot worship all the other gods of this age. It, it, it absolutely should compel us to forsake all forms of idolatry. And, and again, not just you know, building a little statue and making offerings to it or burning incense to it in your house, though that's a bad idea, it's wrong, but also the, the more subtle idols that are very prevalent. I, I understand there's a big football game tonight. And, um, and there are many people who idolatrize those players, teams, or the entire sport, or the, the Super Bowl, or various facets of that in which their, their life and their identity is built around the success or failure of one team or one, one individual, or their life is built around so that everything in their week now revolves around Monday night football, I think they have Tuesday night football now, Thursday night football, any Saturday night football, and Sunday football, and plus the pregame, aftergame shows and all of the highlights and commentary in the week between. And, and we would look at it, and, and I trust we would recognize that when you devote your life to something, that something, and, and you're devoting your life in such a way that that something is making your life meaningful, making you feel like you have some, some existence or some security or it's a basis of some happiness that you have, when you are devoting your life to this thing to fill in the lacks in your heart and your soul, you have made that thing an idol. If that thing dominates your time and your thoughts and your heart, it's an idol. And, and so sometimes the idols are, are, are wrapped in pigskin. Sometimes they're printed with green ink. And we used to put them in our wallet. Sometimes they're little cards with gold chips on them now. It's any number of things. They're ideas. They're, they're, they're sometimes are legitimately possessions. Sometimes they're people. But all of those things. Idols. God alone is to be the object of our greatest love. So that we now have this recognition. Not only is my worship, but there is there's a relationship there. There's a love that is to be there. So he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I mean, that, that takes us, you know, away from just a distant, cold, formal ritual. There's a now a, a, deep, a deep passion, a love, a delight, a joy, an adoration. There's that, that relational aspect now. So that all of my life is devoted to the, the love of this one God. And obviously, it's an all-encompassing love. Whether it be your, your, your heart, your inner man, or your strength, your, your outer man. Whether, whether it be what you feel, which I think is imp implied in the soul, or what you think with your mind. It has to all be given to that love of God. And so when we go to the Bible and we see this is one God, it, it's a fact that is there to compel us to do something. It, it's to compel us to trust Him, to worship Him, and to worship Him, and worship Him alone. Because he is God alone. 